This week, we're going to be looking at a topic or, or kind of a, an umbrella of topics which may be very difficult for some. So I want to approach it uh, pastorally and, and just put it out there from the very beginning. This is a subject, we're going to be talking about divorce <clears throat> and the, the things that Scripture says that helps us understand what are some of the legitimate ways that marriages come to an end. If we've looked at over the last couple of weeks a bit of God's purpose for marriage and what some aspects of marriage look like for Christians as distinct from the culture around us, today we're going to be looking at divorce and when a marriage comes to an end and how we approach that distinct from the culture around us, which for the last four, 50 or so years, uh, since no-fault divorce became law in Australia, uh, where you could just cite irreconcilable differences um, versus having something that we might look at in Scripture and say, well, here are some legitimate reasons for divorce. And so, so what I don't want to do is approach this frivolously or carelessly or even really clinically where we're just going to say, well, <clears throat> here's the theological precepts and that's all that we need to know and then just go and apply it. We, we do want to do that, but we want to do more than just that because, again, there are people among us and certainly the people that you know for whom this is a, a very difficult, even sometimes grievous topic. We, as a church community, uh, over the last 12 or so years, we've, we have been able to, by God's grace, we've been able to come alongside uh, into the hundreds of people who've, who've gotten married here, but also we've been able to help and walk alongside uh, and help even restore marriages that were on the brink of divorce. We've been able to travel with people who have exited marriages that have been, uh, at best, unhelpful and, at worst, very abusive and not, not just toxic but dangerous. God has been one of the, like in the first couple of months, I would say, of uh, City Light Church existing, um, about four months in, we had a young man commit suicide, which was a really massive deal, and a month later, but our first uh, older, our only older couple who was kind of tangentially involved with the church at the time go through a divorce. And so again, we want to consider these things certainly from a biblical perspective. How are we to understand these things? But not, at a, not just at a clinical high level perspective, but that we are walking alongside people. Either you'll, you'll be doing life with people in your discipleship groups, in your families, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, or at least in your extended circle of friends or spheres of influence, somebody who has gone through or is going through or will go through or is a child of divorce. And so we have to understand, God, help us. Please, Lord, help us understand how we should think about this. And so I want to I wanna kind of uh, give it away at the start so that we don't get into some of the scriptures and you start to maybe feel shame or guilt or those kinds of things. I want to I kind of front load it with, here's where we're going to land. Where we're going to talk about how do we think about divorce. We're going to touch on adultery and, and sexual immorality. We're going to talk about abandonment. We're going to talk about abuse as well. But we're not going to go into, into the depths and detail of, of any of those three categories that that I would like to, because genuinely this is already going to be a fairly long sermon, just helping us to have kind of a, a, a framework for understanding divorce. And there's a lot more work that we need to do as we go forward in understanding each of these particular categories. The goal of today is to understand the character and the nature of God, his plan and his purpose, his design and his order for us in how we live, and certainly how we approach and think about marriage, and then when marriages do not honour God? And ultimately, what are the circumstances in which marriages can or that are free to come to an end? I, I am like, I think about, um, you know, those disclaimers when you see an ad selling a financial product and at the end, it's just something like, this is not financial advice. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm not trying to tell you now. I'm not speaking into your particular circumstance now. I'm trying to give us a framework for how we understand these things. 
please, if you hear things that sound like your context, this is a community, this is a family. We, we are a family, we love one another. And our goal is to love each other just like Jesus has loved us. We have the same kind of unity and life on life intimacy and involvement that Jesus has when he took on flesh, like became like us and united us to the Father in himself. And so this is a place for healing. This is a place for grieving when people grieve. It's a place for going through like the, the depths of the worst parts of life. I just mentioned even just things like uh, adultery and abuse and abandonment uh, can be three of the most devastating things that somebody could go through. But we need to say, even though God's design for marriage is that it points to the union between Christ and the church, there would be a, a permanent relationship. But God's design is, like we, like, like we vow when we uh, the, the traditional wedding vows, till death do us part, that that is God's design for marriage. That he doesn't, his will is not that marriages would be, we'd enter into them frivolously or lightheartedly, or that we'd exit them frivolously or lightheartedly. But there are, and spoiler alert, this is getting where we're going to land, there are valid, legitimate, biblical reasons for a marriage to end early. Again, spoiler alert, you don't have to end your marriage if you find yourself in one of these situations or contexts. But the scriptures are, and the gospel, I should say, is, is very liberating for us. There are legitimate cases in which you are free to divorce your spouse. So the kind of, the... The common wisdom is 50% of marriages end in divorce. Anybody else heard that statistic? The half of marriages end in divorce? I've heard that statistic. Heard it quoted for a very long time. Uh, bears very little resemblance to reality, however. Uh, if you look at the statistics just now, even if you stack up all of the marriages in Australia in a year and then all of the divorces in Australia in that same year, for the most recent statistics, new statistics come out next month, so it might have been helpful to do it then, but on most recent statistics from the ABS, <clears throat> it's about 38% of marriages if you stack it up like that. So if you're just counting marriages in, marriages out, in Australia, about 38%. But something like 60% of second-time marriages end in divorce. And so that kind of skews those statistics if you're just marriages in, marriages out, weighing up those. There are some stats, uh, some research that suggests that it's something about uh, one in four marriages that start will end before somebody dies in divorce. About one in four, about 25%. There are some stats, some research that suggests that um, the rate among people who are regular attenders of a Christian church is up to half of that. So we're really talking about about two in a thousand people will get divorced in Australia every year, and about six in a thousand will get married every year. These are the this is kind of the culture in which we live. If we're asking how do we think about marriage or how do we practice marriage and divorce, um, those are the stats. The oh man, I was so surprised to hear this. The average length of a marriage in Australia, on on the most recent stats, is 12.8 years. And in fact, the average uh, length of, of a marriage before separation is just over eight years. So it takes three to four years for a divorce to be finalised in, in, on average in Australia. That's not very long. Eight years on average before Australians say, we're calling it quits. Uh, in South Australia, almost 60% of Aussie adults are married. It's the highest proportion of adults who are married in Australia. We're the most married population in Australia, South Aussies. Uh, if you look at just Christians in Australia, it's about 65% of adults are married, so higher again uh, amongst Christians. And so if we're looking at, this is what, a, this is what marriage 
Again, just at a statistical level, what it kind of looks like, the snapshot in Australia, it, it was uh, the, the divorce statistics kind of spiked around 2021, 22, partly because of COVID, I reckon, partly because the regulations were changed and a big backlog of divorces were all done all in one go. And so again, it's gonna be very interesting to see if the divorce rate is continuing on its downward trajectory like it has over the last couple of decades. But so marriage is also on a downward trajectory as well, as our cultural approach to uh, marriage is also changing. What about Christians? Uh, again, among those who are actively involved in the church community, divorce rates, somewhere between 27% and 50% less than in the culture around us. Now, I heard growing up, the divorce rate is 50% and it's the same in the church and out of the church. It looks like that's not actually the case. And so there, there are differing views in the church to outside the church already. But I put it to you that even in the church, we generally, not you guys, obviously, but the church at large in Australia is very confused as to what, what does God actually think about marriage and what does God say about divorce? And I don't, I don't mean we're all confused in the one direction either. I think there are people who, in, even in the church in Australia, who uh, look exactly like our culture. They would say, oh, if you're not feeling it, God loves you, he wants the best for you. Obviously, this isn't great, get out. And I know for sure there are, again, I have personally walked with friends whose spouse has listened to the culture, listened to, I'd say, the deceiver, who has said, ah, don't worry about it. God wants, God wants what's best for you, which that's true. And this marriage, it's not working out for you just now. It's not fulfilling in the way that you want right now. So you go and you do whatever you want to do, because obviously that's what God wants for you, because God loves you, right? He wouldn't want you to be, wouldn't have to, to want you to have to work hard for happiness. But then at the other end of the spectrum, there'd be Christians, well-meaning Christians, who would say, oh, you said I do. You said to death do us part. That you, you're locked in. You're locked in. There's, you can't leave. And I'm, even, I'm even aware of people who, are, again, who have heard this from people who, who are, from my perspective, or who were in marriages that I would say, uh, man, you, you gotta run and fast. But who other people have said to them, no, 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 I've put up with these same kinds of things for decades and you need to as well. That's what we signed up for. There are misunderstandings all over the spectrum about what even is marriage? What's it supposed to look like? And when, like we looked at last week, we had these two categories of a healthy marriage and in a healthy marriage, you can look at some scriptures like my body doesn't belong to me and my wife's body doesn't belong to her, but we belong to each other. And in a healthy marriage, that can be beautiful and wonderful. And in an unhealthy marriage, that can be crushingly abusive and soul destroying. So today we're also gonna have some categories where we look at in a, in a healthy marriage. And a healthy marriage can still have unhealthy marks. We say, well, we still, we both love Jesus. We're still putting each other towards him, but we're struggling in these areas. And so someone might rightfully come to them and say, like a good advice might be, well, let's look at the scriptures we're gonna look at today. They'll say, ditch your selfishness, repent, forgive, let's come back together. Whereas, Someone from the world might come in and say, oh man, like, that's too much like hard work. They've wronged you in this way, you've wronged them in this way. Better to just call it quits, go find someone who's gonna fulfill you or love you or go do something else. And so we, again, we, do, we want to, the goal of today is, what is the nature and the character of God? What, what does he establish in his divine order for us when it comes to marriage? How, what, what does he invite us into and how does he command us even? to engage with marriage? And then what does it look like for a marriage to be uh, so wrong or terrible 
or to cross over from just unhealthy into destructive and a needing of coming to an end. What does God think about divorce? Let's look at our passage today. This is 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 16. To the married I give this command. It says, not I but the Lord. Later on he's going to say, this isn't straight from the Lord, this is from me. And I've got the Holy Spirit, so I think I'm right. But this is my, this is my opinion, is what he says. And it's in Scripture. This is what he says. This is from the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband. Oh, there you go. Case closed. A wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they're holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. And then a, bit, a little bit later in verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband is living, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants, only in the Lord. So he's saying, he's reiterating what Jesus said in terms of being unequally, unequally yoked. He says, if you're married to an unbeliever and they leave, you're free to leave. You're not bound. If they want to stay, then stay and live in peace. But if they do leave, you're then free to remarry, but don't go and marry another unbeliever. Marry someone in the Lord. But she is happy if she remains as she is, in my opinion. This is Paul talking. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. We'll get a look at that next week. What does it look like to be single or remain single? So Paul wants to highlight, like he's highlighted last week, like he highlighted the week before, like he's continually pointing to this picture of marriage as a sacred union. That's where he starts. That's what he's uplifting. What he's not trying to do is say, <clears throat> okay, here's marriage, and you guys, you want to know your freedom. You want to be like one foot in, one foot out. How will I know, like, how will I know when I've crossed that line? It's like the, um, <clears throat> we might look at this next week or the week after. It's like for the single people who are in a romantic relationship but not yet married, who go, well, how far is too far? They're asking, how close can I get to sin before I cross the line? And Paul's saying, that's the wrong way of looking at it. We want to look over here and say, what, what is this holy institution that God has given us, gifted us? How do we pursue His righteousness, His perfection, His gift? How do we pursue that? This is where Paul starts. What is marriage? What's it for? Why is it important? How it is a protective institution for the vulnerable. In Jesus' day, and certainly in the Old Testament, and even today, particularly for women who were much more vulnerable than men back in the day, to where they could just write a letter of divorce and give it to a woman and say, you're no longer in my family. And all, all of the wealth would stay with him. And she, if she had no family to go back to, destitute. So marriage was very protective for women. It was security for children as well. A covenantal commitment where love and trust grow. And most of all, Paul continually points to how marriage is this prophetic witness of the mystery of the union between Christ and the church. And so he holds it up and says, you in your marriages, we in our marriages, we are proclaiming something with how we live. It is a prophetic witness a forth telling of truth, a truth about Jesus and his bride in how we live our marriages. That we put on display to the world a foreshadowing of the relationship between Jesus and his bride, which is why Paul comes back to Jesus, highlights what was true from the beginning, that God brings together a husband and a wife for life. It's supposed to be a lifelong relationship growing all the time in mutual submission, in love, in trust, in pointing each other towards Jesus. And again, in that kind of radical, prophetic proclamation to the world, we live differently. We're ordered under the lordship of Jesus so we can proclaim with our, 
words and with our very lives and certainly with our marriages. This is what Jesus is like. Your marriage does so much more than just register your relationship with the government. That's not the primary purpose of marriage. This is why Paul starts a section saying, to the married I give this command. And I by the Lord, a wife is not to leave her husband and a husband is not to leave his wife, not to divorce his wife. Marriage is a sacred covenant not to be broken. Paul emphasizes, even if separation does occur, the goal should be then reconciliation sought because marriage is very, very important to God and points to the relationship between Jesus and his bride. When Jesus talks about marriage, he doesn't go back to Moses. He goes right back to the very beginning. This is where he starts. Uh, Matthew 19, some Pharisees come to him and ask, tell us about divorce. And he says, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus again underscores the original design for marriage is a man and woman coming together in a lifelong union. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be life-giving. It's supposed to be, again, that, that mutual submission, mutual preferring the need of the other, mutual pointing each other towards Jesus, mutual laying down my preferences and proclivities and preferring the other. It shows with our lives, again, the witness of Christ and his church. And so the default position for Christians when it comes to marriage is that I'm committing to this woman, I'm committing to this man for life. We don't have any other options. This one is now the one. And so to put it to you, do Christians believe in the one? Yes, but not before marriage. Not that you're on this kind of hunt for the one out there and can I go find the one? But then when you commit to someone, that person is your the one. We focus all of our romantic inclination onto our spouse. There's no other. That's it. It is exclusive, voluntary, intimate. We aren't looking for a better option. We aren't holding our marriage in an open hand. We have no plan B. No, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll just get a divorce. Or if, you know, if we get along 8.6 years later and we go, Oh, I feel like we're just drifting apart. Let's go pursue other kinds of things. We don't think like this. We reject what I heard at a wedding once. Instead of the vow till death do us part, the vow was until the love runs out. <laughs> we're hearing it and going, oh. <laughs> but again, that's indicative. It tells us, it shows us how our culture views marriage and divorce. <clears throat> I'm, we're coming together because we know we're going in the, in the same direction for now and, and we want some security or we want, you know, we want to register our relationship with the authorities and then it's not working out or something happens and we're just going to leave and then we'll go join somebody else and see, you know, until the love runs out and now we're going to get somewhere else and, oh, you want to stay here and I want to go there. So you stay here, I'll go there. This is how our culture at large pursues or thinks about marriage and divorce. But we, we fight for our marriages, actually. We fight against apathy, fight against cowardice, we fight against our wandering eyes, fight against our wandering desires and affections. We fight against sin together. It's no longer me living my life for my purposes and my fulfillment, and I do my thing and you do your thing, and we'll come together while it's convenient or while we have this mutual attraction for one another and to the degree that we have that attraction and, and, and for the life of that attraction we'll stay together. It's not that at all anymore. In, this, in that kind of regard, as soon as somebody, <clears throat> uh, their life goes in a different direction, all of a sudden they become a barrier, the blocker for me fulfilling my life. And so of course I have to get rid of the person. They're blocking me from my ultimate goal which is my own Fulfillment. 
verses. No, we've come together, us together, one flesh, building a life together. That's why Christians, man, we don't joke about getting divorced. It doesn't enter our vocabulary on the regular. We don't joke about it. We don't threaten divorce when we're having a, like a regular kind of disagreement or argument or as we're learning to communicate better. We don't threaten, well, I'll just go then. We don't unilaterally make personal decisions because I'm no longer a me, but we are a we. These are all implications of how we approach marriage. We are blinkered with no option B, no plan B. We are all in. This is it. This is my lot. I, I, I am done, which is why it's so devastating when that trust is betrayed. When we say, I, I, I'm blinking, I'm not looking for other options, I have no plan B, you are my the one, this is it, you have all of my trust. I'm not withholding anything of myself from you. I, I, we, are, we are one. And when that oneness is fractured by the sin of one or both, man, it's devastating to the one who is all in. when a man or woman breaks their marriage vows, when they're romantically or physically entangled with somebody else outside their marriage, when they abandon or abuse their, abuse, abuse their spouse, it's devastating, it's crushing. And so for many in our culture, and it's slipped into the church, we take this view where we say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kind of be mostly in, but a little bit out. I have a contingency. Or I, I, I'm, I'm all in, but my eyes still kind of wander from time to time. I'm not really looking. I'm just, just, just seeing what's out there. Because we know it would be so crushing to just give all of ourselves to somebody and have that, that love and that trust abandoned or abused or destroyed. The problem is when we guard our hearts like that, we're actually already putting a wedge between us and our spouse. We are more likely to end up in divorce, the statistics tell us. And then our, our worst fears were confirmed. We're like, oh man, I'm so glad I did that because otherwise it would have been totally crushed. No, for, for Christians, for us, we risk the devastation to go all in. We put it all on the line. We show the world the love of Jesus for his bride. Our hearts are so open to our husband or to our spouse, uh, to our wife, that we risk all the greater pain should our heart be trampled, uh, trampled on. To be really fully known and, and fully loved, that is the, that's one of the goals of marriage. And so we don't withhold our parts of ourselves, just like we don't withhold parts of ourselves from God. So here Paul's desire to echo the commitment of Christ for his bride when he writes, if a, warm, if a woman does leave her husband, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to him. So the goal in ordinary circumstances would be reconciliation, to live out the gospel and come together again. However, like Jesus does, Paul acknowledges the reality and the destructive nature of sin and the brokenness in the world. And so where sin and brokenness, unrepentance and selfishness are features of marriage, God commands us to repent and be reconciled to our spouse. Where husband and wife have mutual submission and love and pursue Jesus together, prefer the needs of one another, repentance and forgiveness are features of marriage. God be praised. That's wonderful. And where reconciliation isn't possible or appropriate, like I know, I know some husbands and many wives who would love to be reconciled to their spouse who has abandoned them. And, and there is no real possibility of reconciliation. And then there are others who, it just would not be appropriate, it would be dangerous uh, 
mortally dangerous for them to be reconciled. It's not, it's not appropriate for reconciliation. Where that's the case, God hasn't left us ignorant of his care and his consideration for victims of a spouse who has abused or abandoned them. So we want to look into scripture to help us understand what are we to think about where we've looked at the purpose of marriage and, and what marriage is in its best uh, in its best context. But because of sin, because of the brokenness of the world, uh, Paul understands it. He gives us some, some categories for when a marriage needs to come to an end. Jesus gives us categories of where a marriage can come to an end. Even the Old Testament scriptures give us some categories. So if you look at Deuteronomy 24, it says, If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her and send her away from his house. If after leaving his house she goes and becomes another man's wife and the second man hates her, writes her a divorce certificate and hands it to her and sends her away from his house, or if he dies, the first husband who sent her away may not marry her again after she has been defiled because that would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt on the land the Lord your God is giving to you as an inheritance. So if we look at this, we'll see it seems actually quite Simple and almost, man, it's just a, a guy goes, oh, I just decide today that there's something in my wife that I find displeasing. He could send her away. Jesus has something to say about that, which we'll get to. But it does show us that uh, even in the law, there's allowance for divorce and then remarriage. What he says is if, if that happens, to, and, and you can even hear it in here, how vulnerable women were back in that day that a man could just go, well, I am displeased today. Take this note, you're out. And then another man, he goes, I'm displeased with you today. Here's another note, you're out. Holy moly. The fact that they were supposed to be married, committed to one another for life, was, in its original design, very protective for women. It's a good reason to believe this passage is referring to a practice of when a, when a husband would prostitute out his wife. But wanting to do it in the law, he would give her a divorce, she'd get married, come back the next day, get married again. And God says, we, we don't do that. The prohibition to remarry the first husband kind of circumvented that practice. In Exodus, there's another rule, Exodus 21, uh, if a man takes a wife or an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing or, or marital rights of the first wife. If he does not do these things for her, she may leave free of charge without any payment. Doesn't have to give any dowry, doesn't have to sacrifice or become destitute herself. So the first case in Deuteronomy uh, about a man sending his wife away, a second case in Exodus about a woman leaving a negligent or abusive husband. Towards the end of the Old Testament in Malachi 2, it says, watch yourselves carefully so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. If he hates and divorces his wife, says Yahweh, God of Israel, he, co he covers his garment with injustice. He is wearing injustice when he sends his wife away, says Yahweh of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Don't act treacherously. And by the time these Pharisees come to Jesus in Matthew 19 and say, they, they come to test him. So they're saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? It seems that in Deuteronomy, if a husband is displeased with his wife, like for any grounds, he can send her away. So they come to Jesus and say, what's the deal with divorce, man? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? And he replied, like we looked at earlier, haven't you read? He who created them in the beginning made them male and female and he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and send her away? <clears throat> They're kind of twisting Moses' words there. So why did Moses command us? Jesus doesn't have that. He told them Moses permitted you, not commanded, but permitted you, to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your heart. But it was not like that from the beginning. 
I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So Jesus reiterates where we started. Marriage is a commitment for life. How can two who have become one become two again, he says. And, and then they reply, so how come divorce is commanded? Jesus says, divorce is not commanded. It's permitted because you have hard hearts, because of brokenness and your sin. Moses says, you can. It is permitted. Jesus says, but it's not the rule. You can't just do it. You're committed for life. And the disciples come to him later and say, if that's the case, who can get mar- who's going to get married? If we can't just come together in marriage and then leave when we want, who's going to commit to someone for life? This is too much. Jesus says, not everyone can accept this saying. But if you can accept it, you should. This is what it was like from the beginning. This is God's design from the beginning. This is God's gift for those who are going to get married. They would commit to one another for life. Moses said you can write, he, he permitted you because of your hardened, sinful hearts. Because sometimes people will walk away from that commitment so that people don't stay in a marriage where other men and women are being brought into that marriage without their permission. So that when someone is abandoned and so that when there is abuse because of sin, there is an escape from a treacherous marriage. It says marriage is for life. It, it, it gives us the first category or, or biblical grounds, you might say, for divorce. And it's not adultery. It's the same word we looked at last week and the week before, porneia, sexual immorality. Again, it's this umbrella term that does include adultery. <laughs> Please hear me, I'm not saying it doesn't include adultery. It absolutely doesn't include adultery. But it's not just adultery. It is sexual immorality. This word porneo that we looked at, uh, in, in the marriage, this picture of Christ and the bride is tainted because of a wandering eye or a wandering heart or wandering genitals. It's just like an umbrella category for sexual disorder, perversion away from God's intended order. And like we've seen already, includes things like sexual or emotional adultery. Uh, Even engaging in pornography, I'd say, is included in this term porneia. We we literally, we get the word pornography from the same word. It doesn't say you have to get divorced. It doesn't say if someone commits sexual immorality in a marriage, and say, well, you know, you must just... Turns it around and says, no, he didn't command you to get divorced, but he permitted you to get divorced. So you can be reconciled where that's good and appropriate, and you can leave where that is good and appropriate. Secondly, in our passage today, 1 Corinthians 7.15, if an unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister isn't bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. So Paul helps us understand another ground for divorce, which these are really both echoes of the Old Testament um, understanding. It's the abandonment by, in this case, specifically an unbelieving spouse. If an unbelieving partner leaves a marriage, the believer is not bound in such circumstances. He's first saying, uh, if the unbeliever is spouse... Check, check, we're back. If an unbelieving spouse is willing to stay, Paul writes, well then stay, because again, our goal is to show prophetically Jesus' commitment to his bride. And so if if there is peace in the marriage, stay. But if they desire to leave, you're not bound. We'll come back to, what about a spouse who professes faith in Jesus, but abandons their spouse? We'll come back to that. Uh, but what he's basically saying is unbelief itself is not grounds for divorce. If you get married and, and one person becomes a Christian, Paul's saying that's not really a good reason for you to leave 
your spouse. God, in a sense, makes that person holy. Not saved, but holy for the sake of the children. So those children can be children of the covenant as well. So we, and then he goes on to say, Man, how do you know? Staying with them, praying for them, showing them. Again, prophetically with your lives and with your words, how you love, how you are ordered by the order of the Father. He says, you might save your husband. You might save your spouse. You're not guaranteeing it. But he's saying, who knows? Third is abuse, which some might say, I would even say, is really a, a subcategory of abandonment where a husband or a wife has, they have abandoned their marriage, abandoned their vows, even though they're still physically present in their marriage. The abusive spouse proving, I would suggest, unbelief that their Lord is not Jesus by their dead works, having abandoned their role and duty to their spouse. So Paul here writes, God has called you to live in peace. An abusive spouse has broken that peace. I had a question in our DG this week. Oh, what about if there's physical violence? Um, this person was saying, I, I've heard. Some people say, well, you've got to stay, you've got to stay in the marriage because you're committed. Uh, and I, I say, man, no, <laughs> you need to run. Le- like leave. I would say leave today, actually. If it's not just physically, but specifically physically or sexually dangerous to, to be in an abusive house, uh, leave. I'm not commanding you to leave. Don't, don't think I have that kind of authority. But I, and I'm not saying you should even get divorced necessarily. But I'm saying, please, for the, for the love of God, uh, get away from the source of that abuse. We can figure out your theology of divorce and separation later. But right now, we need to get you to a place of physical safety. We have to do it. There is is no prohibition in Scripture against this. Don't think, well, I I, I love my husband or I love my wife. And we have traveled with people in both sexes through this journey many times. Don't think that you are somehow being being long-suffering in a way that brings God honour or glory. Get out, please. And and not just get out and go abstract yourself. Come to your discipleship group leader, to me, to trusted person in the church, to one of the elders, one of our leaders. We would be honoured to help you in this situation. We see abuse covered in this Exodus passage. And so the principles in Exodus provide us a basis for understanding that neglect, abuse, abandonment are also, can be grounds, biblically like valid and legitimate grounds for ending a marriage. And again, in the case of physical or sexual abuse, my recommendation is immediate separation. Interestingly, I heard one commentator uh, in, in thinking through how, do we, how should we think about abuse and abandonment uh, when it comes to Christian marriages. And they look at when the rule is we're married for life, we commit to one another for life, how do we then think about it? And he said, well, have a look at how Jesus talks about the Sabbath in Matthew 12. Let me read it for you. At the time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some of the heads of grain. When the Pharisees saw this, they came to him and said, See, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said, haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry, how he entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him or those with him to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath, but are innocent. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Moving on from there, he entered the synagogue. There he saw a man who had a shriveled hand 
And in order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He replied to them, who among you, if he has a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A person is worth far more than a sheep. So it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. And then Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath. He says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And Jesus goes out of his way all the time to do good on the Sabbath. He commends the people for what could be considered breaking the law, like God's ordinary order. And Jesus commends the ones who break the ordinary order in order to do good on the Sabbath, preventing harm or stopping harm from happening. So when David and his men were starving, they went and ate what was not lawful for them to eat. Jesus commends them for doing good on the Sabbath. Now I want to be very careful here to not say, well, God has instituted order and, and, and rules and we can just break them willy-nilly if by our own rationale we can twist them to, to be good. That's how, that's, how, that's how some people approach the Bible. We do not want to do this. We don't throw open the gates to like a no-fault divorce or licentiousness. License when we talk about the exceptions to the rule. We are not frivolous with marriage. So as we understand, how do we think about God's order and doing good in a way that would break his normal order? The principle is he desires mercy, not sacrifice. He says to them, who of you wouldn't pick up? Your sheep has fallen into a ditch. You're telling me on the Sabbath you're not going to pick up that sheep. He says, you all do that. And here you are condemning the innocent. For me, we can't be party to condemning the innocent and saying you must stay in an abusive marriage. That is horrific. That's heinous. That is anti-gospel. That, that, that does not prophetically put on display the witness of Jesus and his bride. That prophetically puts on display a lie about Jesus and his bride. And so in the same way, I think this absolutely applies to those in abusive marriages. And there's a solid and biblical case that there is freedom to exit those marriages. Now, I don't want to use abuse the way that our culture uses the word abuse. Just like I wouldn't want to use the word trauma like our culture uses the word trauma where it just kind of keeps eating up more and more real estate where everything becomes abuse. So everything becomes Trauma. I want to be very careful that we are staying in the categories that um, the scripture tells us so that if we're in healthy marriages, praise God, if we're in unhealthy but not abusive marriages, we do the work to make them healthy marriages. But we need to understand where there are marriages that, are, that have, again, sexual immorality in the ways we've looked at today, abandonment where husband and wife has walked away from the marriage or where there is the kinds of neglect and abuse that we've looked at here, that there are valid grounds for pursuing divorce. What about remarriage? Paul talks about this in Romans 7. He says, well, if your spouse dies, of course you're free to get remarried. I've seen in the Old Testament where there is divorce and then remarriage and, and that seems to be sanctioned. That seems to be okay. Uh, in our passage today, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be released. Are you released? Are you released from a wife? Don't seek a wife. However, if you do get married, so if you're betrothed, just don't seek to be released. Go through with the marriage. If you've been married and now you're no longer married, he says, don't, don't seek to be remarried. But if you do, he says, you haven't sinned. And if a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. But such people will have trouble in this life and I'm trying to spare you. So like we'll see next week, he says, oh man, it might be easier for you to stay single. It might be easier for you to stay single. 
But if you get remarried, that's not a sin. I would put it to you that for some who have gotten divorced, Christians who have gotten divorced, uh, because, say, a husband has an extramarital adulterous affair and then leaves his wife, uh, for me, I don't think that person should get remarried to the person he's sleeping with. I think that he has not, ha- even though his wife has biblical grounds to go to divorce and remarry, I would say that he is, in some senses, in a biblical sense, still beholden to his wife and should stay single for the rest of his life. Or, if he can somehow, over time, demonstrate, and his wife is open to it, be reconciled. But I don't think she's under compulsion to do so. Now, if I start going into more kind of nuanced categories, we could be here all day. Again, I don't want to speak to your specific circumstance. I'm trying to help us understand the category of marriage and divorce. Marriage is designed by God to be a reflection of his covenant relationship with his people. It's meant to be a lifelong commitment characterized by love and respect and mutual support and submission. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 is emphasizing the kind of sacrificial love and respect that should mark Christian marriages, mirroring and echoing and even foreshadowing a sense of Jesus and his bride, the church. But again, we're a community in which God heals broken hearts. Like Jesus says, because of our hardened hearts, because of our sinful proclivities, he's given us ways that we can exit Marriages that, again, are not showing that prophetic witness. So if you are in marriage and you're struggling in your marriage, again, like last week, please reach out. We've seen so many marriages, even ones at the brink of divorce, come back and be reconciled and over time, as trust and that mutuality is restored, uh, come back into being wonderful, God-honoring marriage. We've seen it happen over and over and over again. again. I'm not trying to guarantee this will happen, but I'm saying God does do this. If you're suffering abuse, again, we are here for you and please don't delay. We're here for you, reach out. Or if you don't know, is this okay? Like we looked at last week, go speak to someone and say, is this Okay. It doesn't feel right to me. Is this okay? If you are divorced, if you've divorced someone with biblical grounds, again, we love you. Man. The gospel of grace is wonderful. And like I said before, it, it is, it's devastating to go all in on someone and have that betrayed. I want, I want to remind you of the love and the intimacy of the Father for you. He cares for you. It sucks that you went through that. And we want to be a community where we love you as well and we get around you and you can experience the love of God even through us too. We're here for you. If you've been abandoned or abused, we love you. You have a family here. Again, over the last 12, 12 and a half years, we've seen people who, uh, a a couple, like a few where it's happened in the church, but many where, especially single mums, but even single dads have come into our community and found a loving family. People who have escaped abusive or they've been abandoned and they've come looking for community and looking for love. They've found the love of Jesus, like from him, but also among us. And you can too. And if you're wondering, if you have a specific kind of case and you think, should I stay or should I go? Again, please would you reach out. Invite somebody into your life, into your marriage, Someone who loves you, loves your spouse, loves Jesus, who wants to come alongside you and not just tell you what to do. And again, we want to, we want to be aware of those people on the, on the edges of the spectrum who will be like, no, you said yes, I do, and you're locked in. Or the others who are like, no, nah, don't worry about it, man. Like, get out of it. But rather have this scripturally informed understanding of the character of God and his 
plan for marriage and divorce to speak into your life. Again, next week we're going to look at singleness, and that, again, will be challenging for many. The week after, we're going to look at what does it look like to go from being single to married or married to widow, widower, married to divorce, divorce to remarriage, and what does Scripture have to say about these things. Uh, in our discipleship groups this week, can we, can we approach this not kind of clinically or, or abstract or high level, but let's come down into our lives and... and even expose some of our lives so that people can speak into it lovingly, restoratively. Uh, and in, in every way, our goal, our ultimate goal, is that we bring glory with our lives. And my hope is that we be a community where our marriages starkly proclaim the prophetic witness of the mystery of the union between Christ and his bride. that we, we have those marriages where, uh, yes, as individuals, we, we are living like that as well, but, but it's in particular then when our, those individuals come together in marriage, that it is a prophetic witness and bright lights all over because our world is suffering, not knowing what marriage is for and not knowing what divorce is for either. And so we want to be a city set on a hill that shines its light, cannot be hidden, a lamp on a, on a lampstand that gives light to all in the house with our gospel witness and then also with our way of life, with our marriages. Let's pray together. So Father, I, I feel like we've, we've just kind of scratched the surface of this topic and so uh, please help us for, for people who are, for whom this maybe has opened a wound or... Has, um, has given them more questions than answers. Please help us, Father, to be the community you've made us to be pursuers of truth in your ways. You are our God. Jesus is our King. I will acknowledge him today and over everything, over every aspect of our lives and certainly over our marriages. So help us to have marriages that honour you. We want to live in the ways that you've invited and commanded us. We don't want to be frivolous with marriage and divorce. Father, I want to thank you that you do protect the vulnerable. You have, you've given us uh, not just the, your, your perfect order, but um, you understand that we're sinful and broken. Help us to have be a community where marriages honour you, where we love one another, where husbands lay down their lives for the bride. We have this prophetic witness of mutual submission and love and trust and pointing each other to Jesus, forgiveness and, and repentance and reconciliation are features and marks of our marriages. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Help us, Lord to love the abused, the abandoned, to be a home and a welcome, to be a source of love and peace and joy because we get that from you. And help us in every way to point everyone to you. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.